Well, welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. Every once in a while you come across a book and you think, man, I wish this would have been written 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, privileged today to, to have a conversation with the author of one of those books. The book is called What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. And it was both the title and especially that subtitle that just drew me in. I mean, listen to this, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. If you followed Breakpoint uh, at any point, you know that we talk an awful lot about bioethics. Chuck Colson talked a lot about bioethical issues. Uh, but we're at a point now where things that were far off in the future are very much in the present. Things that were the debates in college, uh, you know, uh, maybe college classrooms, maybe among intellectual elites are now technologies that we have access to. And it's no longer a, a hypothetical ethical conversation that we need to have. It's very much a very front and center conversation we need to have. And uh, that's why I am uh, very honored and privileged to have Professor Carter Sneed from Notre Dame. He's a professor of law, as well as a professor of political science and the director of the, and I really should have asked you how to pronounce this going in, the Nicola? The Nicola. The Nicola, of course, the Nicola uh, Center for Ethics uh, and Culture. Uh, Professor Sneed, it's an honor to have you here on the Breakpoint Podcast. It's an honor to be with you. And let me just tell you, Chuck Colson was a hero uh, in so many different ways, but especially on matters relating to bioethics. And when I was general counsel to President Bush's council bio- on bioethics back in the early 2000s, he loomed very large and, and your organization uh, loomed very large in the, in the, in, on the front lines of the battle for human dignity. And I'm, it's a great honor to be on your show. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. We've uh, certainly had a, a strong interest uh, in, in these issues because it hits so much to core worldview issues, core, core issues, obviously about right and wrong. But as you point out in the title of your book, uh, what we're really talking about here is not just a, uh, a, a question or a problem of morality. It is a question of anthropology. It's not just what's right and wrong. Before we get there, we got to figure out who it is that we're talking about who it is that we're working on, who it is that we're trying to birth or save or conceive or fix or whatever else. Um, and and I, I want to start with something that uh, somebody that you quote, Alistair McIntyre, who makes this statement, we are forgetful of the body. That is a remarkable uh, observation that we now have folks that are writing about this, and certainly in sexual ethics, if you talk about um, Christopher West translating John Paul uh, for us, Protestant evangelicals. Uh, certainly, it's the question of sexual ethics uh, and the LGBTQ issues. And for you to just get to the heart of it, not just that when we ask questions about what are appropriate reproductive technologies, what should we, how should we handle end of life questions, and all of those things, um, that, that we not only need to ask the question, what's a human being, but we need to take seriously the concept, you know, of the body. And, and you say we have to rem- begin by remembering the body. I, 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 that's just that's just such a profound line, and I just want to give you uh, some some time to just unlock that for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the books the book makes sort of two claims: a methodological claim and a substantive claim that are connected to what you were just describing. And use the word anthropology. A lot of people, when they hear the word anthropology, they imagine some kind of academic discipline involving, you know, people going to faraway islands to study remote peoples and report back on them. Uh, what, I, you, what I mean when I use the word anthropology is something far more basic and kind of more original. It's just, I just mean an account of what it means to be human and what constitutes human flourishing. And, um, uh, and, and that's, and, and Walker Percy, famous Catholic Christian novelist wrote that, everyone has an anthropology. Everyone assumes what we are and what our flourishing is, but rarely does it ever actually come to the surface. And what I try to argue in the book is that the richest way to understand these public questions, these legal questions and policy questions relating to abortion, assisted reproduction and end of life decision-making, although my argument I think applies to any question of public bioethics and maybe any question of law and policy more generally, is that the richest way to understand any law and public policy is not just the doctrinal principles, not just what the law does or says, not even what the normative goods that the law aims to promote or harms it aims to avoid are, but in fact, what the law assumes a person to be and what constitutes human flourishing. Because all law 
exists and is only intelligible through the lens of its purpose of promoting the flourishing of persons and protecting persons. That's what the law is supposed to be at. Without an, a, a preliminary or a premise about what a person is, the law, you can't even judge whether the law makes sense, whether it's just, whether it's humane. And so the first the methodological argument I make is we need to rethink these questions and reframe these questions in terms of the underlying premises about what they assume a person to be and what constitutes human flourishing. And it's not the question of when life begins, although it's certainly connected to and influences that question. It is even what who you and I are, what like what constitutes our flourishing? What are we? And that's the methodological point. The substantive point that I argue is that when you look at the, these, and I take those three areas, what I call the vital conflicts of public bioethics, uh, where life and death is genuinely at stake in abortion, assisted reproduction, and end of life decision making, when you analyze the current landscape of American law inductively, when you ask what does the law say and what are its premises about anthropology, what you find is something pretty disturbing. You find that the vision of the person and human flourishing that animates all three areas of the law is this abstraction. It's not what you and I are, it's this abstraction, what Charles Taylor and Robert Bella have called expressive individualism. And it, it, it understands you and I not to be embodied beings or embodied souls, but rather to be disembodied wills. What defines you and me is, uh, is our will, is our capacity to formulate future directed plans based on our internal desires and the interior of the self and to configure our lives in a way that aim at that particular goal. They think of the fundamental unit of human reality as the atomized individual will. It doesn't, who we are is not a function of our relationships to others, our parents, our, our families, our traditions, our religion. It means no, it, that's, that those are all just artifacts and instruments to be harnessed and wielded in the pursuit of the projects of our will. And the reason that that vision of human flourishing and human identity is false. As we know, if we think for a second about our, share, our, our lived reality, is that we, we don't come into the world as disembodied wills. Mm -hmm. We come into the world as embodied beings with bodies. We encounter each other as bodies, living bodies, dying bodies, bodies that get sick, bodies that are vulnerable. And, um, and not only does it give a false account of who we are, it renders invisible our obligations to vulnerable others. We don't have any unchosen obligations in this anthropology of expressive individualism, including especially to the weakest and most vulnerable, vulnerable among us, namely children, both born and unborn, uh, uh, the disabled and the elderly, just to take three examples of vulnerable populations who are very much at the center of these bioethical conflicts that I point out. And, and, and all of those vulnerable populations are vulnerable precisely because they have lost their ability to express themselves. They've lost their full ability to choose, to be, uh, to, to be autonomous. Um, you know, th this is a, uh, you, you, I mean, that's the, common, that's the common trait that they all have. That's exactly right. And I wondered, you know, I I've been working on these things for about 20 years, these questions, these public questions of a, the law of abortion, assisted reproduction, and end-of-life decision-making. What I kept coming back to is why is it that our current law can't even see or give a, an intelligible account of children and the disabled and the elderly. They're left completely behind. I mean, in your state of Colorado, the elderly and the disabled weren't really part of the conversation right. in the assisted suicide debate. The unborn child wasn't really part of the conversation in the recent referendum on late-term abortions that you all just had. And the reason is because the kind of, and the libertarian worldview of a person taken in an abstract way as basically a, an atomized will who, who flourishes by imposing that will on the, on the world around it, can't even make sense of what a child is. A child doesn't even make sense in that, in that worldview. One of the things I want our listeners to know is that there has been a flurry of books wrestling with many of the concepts uh, that you have just uh, brought up, a flurry of works. It goes back in many ways, as you said, to Robert Bella and especially Charles Taylor's understanding of the self, that modernism didn't just, you know, bring us technology and war and, uh, you know, lots of cool gadgets and stuff like that, but it actually changed how we understand the human person. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, folks are writing more on. You use that phrase expressive individualism as kind of the tail end of where do we land after all the promises of utopia and perfection fall short, all that's left is, well, I'm just going to be who I want to be by doing what I want to do or imposing my will. Uh, Carl Truman has a new book on expressive individualism that, it, and so I'm so grateful that there's so much work being done here 
because as we said, we're dealing not just, I, I feel like a lot of Christians look at so many of these issues, even sexual ethics, L, the LGBTQ issues, and we see them all in terms of morality. Like the whole game is things that were once considered right are now considered wrong and vice versa, when really we're talking about a shift that's much more fundamental, much more core to who we are. And I just want to bring so many of these concepts to our audience because it's so vitally important for them to understand as pastors, uh, especially as more and more of these technologies that deal with the beginning of life, the uh, creation, you know, procreative technologies, as well as um, uh, end of life issues become more and more in our grasp. They're not, you know, these kind of conceptual things. So uh, it's, this is such, such an important conversation. Um, when I when I saw your book, uh, Professor Schneed, I, I immediately thought of a framework that has been super helpful uh, for me from T.S. Eliot in an article he wrote on education, where he basically made the point that before you know what to do with something, you have to f know what something is for. Uh, in other words, but, but, but law, we, we think of law and policy as uh, being so much about, you know, do this, don't do that. It's okay to do this, but not okay to do that. And what you're arguing here is that this stuff actually, before it does any of that, reflects a vision of who we are and what we're for. You know, that's exactly right. And um, Alistair McIntyre and After Virtue talks about this, the idea yep. of the loss of what philosophers call teleology, right? Like the, the loss of a conception that there are actually objective realities that, that help us understand, that, that we can understand through the natural givens. Like you, 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 know, you see something in the world and you can actually, by studying something in the world, you can understand what it's for, what its purpose is. But in the, in the anthropology of expressive individualism, their only purpose for anything is, the, is, is, the, is the, to bend it in a way that makes it instrumental to the imposition of my subjective will. Even the and body it, itself. Exactly, especially the body itself, mm -hmm. right? The body has no normative meaning. There's no, uh, there's no sense at all in which, and in in, just to take a, an obvious example, you take the example of pregnancy, right? Mm -hmm. If you read the philosophers who support abortion rights that influenced heavily Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey and these other opinions, their account of what pregnancy is, is completely inhuman. The idea, and I don't mean that normatively, I mean descriptively, it, it doesn't even make sense. It describes the unborn child as some kind of stranger, some kind of parasitic stranger, alien invader that is grappling with the mother, another stranger over scarce resources. I mean, the analogies that they give are analogies of, you know, a, a woman being attached to a violinist by, by, you know, abducted and attached to a violinist, so her body has to clean his blood for nine months or people seeds that come in through the window and embed themselves and become babies. That's not how human beings, and, and only, a, only a philosopher who has completely abstracted any, any aspect of reality can come up with those sort of crazy hypotheticals and have them basically adopted and reflected in our law. The idea that the, the unborn child is a non-person invader that the mother has to have the weapon of abortion to liberate herself from. That's, that's being forgetful of the body. That's forgetting the fact that every single pregnancy involves a relationship of child and mother. It's a parent-child relationship. And it's not simply an occasion to express yourself and to express your individuality and to try to free yourself so you can be a free and equal participant in the social and economic life of the country. Let me bring up another scenario. This is one that I've been kind of thinking about uh, since the Obergefell decision uh, gave same-sex marriage to the world. And of course, one of the, the, the main areas, you take this framework that you develop around this idea of the human person and trying to apply it to these policy, uh, public policy when it comes to public bioethics, and you apply it to abortion, assisted reproduction, and death and dying. I want to take that middle one there for just a second, because we talk about the, the body gets in the way. The body should be malleable to bend to my will. Um, it seems to me that more and more what is driving uh, reproductive tourism in third world nations, particularly uh, the push for commercial surrogacy, uh, which we have seen, by the way, also in the state of Washington and the state of New York, um, is being driven in many ways by the so-called right to parent uh, that follows the right to marry one of somebody uh, of one's own sex. So same-sex marriage, of course, was sold to us that love is love, that uh, there's not an inherent connection between um, marriage and procreation. And now we're on the backside of that whole debate having embraced same-sex marriage, and many couples that chose a, 
a, a relationship that was biologically sterile, just by nature, just by givens, are now demanding assisted reproductive technologies so that because they have the right to be a, a, a parent. Is, is, is that a, what, what do you think about that analogy or uh, yeah, that let analysis? Me, let me read you something real quick from the, from the book. And I think it will capture, I mean, the, the legal landscape and I think the political landscape regarding questions of procreation are deeply, deeply influenced by this anthropology of expressive individualism. There are two quotes. Chapter four is the chapter on, on assisted reproduction. And I begin the chapter with two quotes. One is from a, a law professor uh, named John Robertson who passed away years ago. He was basically the godfather of the law of assisted reproductive technologies in the United States. He sat on the, he was the chairman of the ethics committee of, for the uh, um, uh, ASRM, the uh, the assisted the, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is the principal uh, professional society in, that 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 uh, that has the most influence on laws and public policies in this space, and he said, and I'm quoting from his book *Children of Choice*: "Reproductive technologies are means to achieve or avoid the reproductive experiences that are central to personal conceptions of meaning and identity." And I I paired that with a quote from a guy named Dr. Jerry Shatton who was a scientist from then at the University of Pittsburgh who gave testimony to the President's Council on Bioethics. And we asked him six weeks in advance, can you formulate a very short explanation for what you think the purpose of reproductive technologies are? And he said, reproductive medicine is helping prospective parents to realize their own dreams for a disease-free legacy. Wow. Now, if you Whoa. listen to those- Whoa. Hey, listen, read that again. Can you yeah, read that? Yeah. Just, that that's, that, I mean, that, people need to just dwell on that that idea is what's driving this. Reproductive medicine is helping prospective parents to realize their own dreams for a disease-free legacy. It sounds like Iceland eradicating Down syndrome. It sounds like Gattaca, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like- <laughs> it By the sounds, way, Chuck Colson's favorite movie on this. He used to oh, quote Gattaca I, all yeah, the time. I, that doesn't surprise me given how yeah. insightful he was. Um, yeah, so the theory of of the theory of reproduction itself or procreation itself is to fulfill the dreams of, of an individual, right? Like there, and the child is an instrument to that end. Now, let me say this. I know for a fact that there are people in the world who desperately want to be parents and that's what they want to be. And they feel betrayed by their bodies and they seek, you know, fertility care. And, 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 you know, my family is 100% built through adoption. All my babies, we adopted all my babies and and so I know what people I know what it feels like to um, to 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 desperately want to be a parent, and you think that's part of. But the point of being a parent is not to satisfy your own right. self interest. The point of being a parent is to is to provide uh, is to provide a humanized cosmos for a new human being that comes into the world. Right, the Gil Mylander, amazing. Uh, Lutheran theologian and bioethicist, maybe the smartest person writing in bioethics that I know of, and I know a lot of very smart mm -hmm. people, and, uh, you know, talks about, you think of a child as something that is begotten and not made, right? You can't, you, we can't think of children that are something that are made for our purposes. We're not, and, and any, any ideology that says that the purpose of procreation is to satisfy my own desire and my own self-identity is flawed. And the problem, and the, the big thing that's missing from those two quotes, the big thing that's missing from our law and policy relating to assisted reproduction is the best interest of the child. That, that's, that's what being a parent is all about. And parent implies a relationship. There's no parent without a child. And so you can't, so even the word parent itself cuts against expressive individualism. Uh, and I think that, and I argue in the book that we have to reflect on that. And, and our laws have to be grounded in the truth that that the whole purpose of any kind of procreative activity um, should have at the end of that, the, 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 the birth of a child who is welcomed and loved unconditionally and is not thought of as a, a product uh, into which people pour their hopes and dreams. Okay. Uh, my guest today is Professor Carter Sneed from Notre Dame. The book uh, is uh, just a, uh, a stunning uh, work on public bioethics, what it means to be human, the case for the body in public uh, bioethics. Uh, and uh, I should have the publisher right here. Where's the, who, the publisher? Is it Harvard? Harvard University Press. Harvard publisher. University Press. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I was thinking. But, but offering this anthropological framework for trying to renegotiate public policy. I, look, uh, Professor Jeanine, I think there's probably going to be a little skepticism, and I want you to address it on, you know, public policy. The, you know, it's it, the, the, the genie so far out of the bottle. 
uh, the cat so far out of the bag, how do you even begin to put it back in? And I, I want you to get to that here in just a second. Mm -hmm. but, but I want to move. Uh, to, we, we've talked the abortion uh, category. We've talked assisted reproduction. I want to talk about death and dying here just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, mainly because, uh, you know, two, two things. I'm in Colorado. We are, I think, the ninth state to have doctor assisted suicide. Uh, I have very dear friends in New Zealand, uh, and uh, we are recording this conversation the day after uh, an expanded doctor-assisted death bill became law there in New Zealand. And uh, one of my uh, uh, friends down there has spent the last couple of years fighting that battle unsuccessfully, he himself having uh, severe uh, disabilities, uh, but also just one of the most brilliant guys that I know. Um, and obviously we're in the middle of COVID. We're in the middle of thinking about death maybe in ways that we hadn't in the past. And, um, so let's apply it there. Uh, and I, I not really a question. I just want to hear you apply this framework right there. What is, where does expressive individualism corrupt public policy when it comes to end of life issues? And wow. what, what does a, a, a renewed reimagined framework look like? Yeah. So, so. I take up two different contexts in death and dying space. I talk about discontinuing life-sustaining measures uh, for people who are dependent on life-sustaining measures. And I talk about assisted suicide, which are ethically and legally distinct, although there are important points of overlap between those two things, which depend on the intentions of the person involved and who's under. And I, and I focus specifically on people who have lost their capacity to make decisions on their own behalf in the life-sustaining measures context. And I talk about assisted suicide. But for both contexts, the question that I ask is the same question that I ask in the other two contexts, which is what vision of the person and human flourishing is reflected in the laws and policies in these areas? And it's the same answer, unfortunately. The vision of the person, the vision that the, of the person that the law is meant to serve is the atomized individual will who's, who is authoring his or her own story, trying to trying to and, and projects onto the legal context or projects onto the individual patient, this vision of the, the will to power operating at its highest flourishing, seeking to apply its unencumbered self to the end of its life story. But anybody who's ever known anyone who is dependent upon life-sustaining measures or who is, has a terminal illness who's contemplating suicide is you're not talking about a person who is an unencumbered will. That's a person who's and especially a person who's lost legal competence in the, in the uh, life-sustaining measures context, you're talking about a person who is profoundly vulnerable, profoundly dependent upon others, profoundly subject to natural limits, and, is su and who doesn't want to impose their unencumbered self. They just want help, right? A person doesn't go to the doctor in any context to assert their unencumbered will. They go to the doctor because they're sick and they need somebody to help them. They need somebody to take care of them. And to... to, to animate the law with a vision of the atomized individual will misses that entirely and misses what our obligations to those folks are. So end of life decision making tries to allow people who have lost competence to control their caregiving by remote control using a living will or some document or, or, or some legal process that tries to reconstruct what they would have wanted when they were healthy and at the height of their intellectual powers if they ever were in that condition. And that's not what we're supposed to do when we, we encounter a sick person. We're supposed to say, and of course that matters, but we want to think about what, who the patient is in their current state and what they need in their current state. Not, not how can we end their story with, uh, you know, according to what we have an idealized sense of what they would have wanted uh, at, the height of their, at the height of their powers. Social science evidence shows people are terrible about predicting what they would want when they right. lose the capacity to choose. And especially given our a demographic shift where we're gonna have an even bigger population of people suffering from dementia, there are very dramatic instances in which a person suffering from dementia gets pneumonia and they feel bad and they want help, they want antibiotics, but someone comes in and says, well, no, you can't give them antibiotics even if they're asking for them because when they were legally competent, they wrote a living will imagining what they would want in this moment, binding themselves to a prior preference. That's expressive individualism. And then you see also in the context of assisted suicide, the premise that what assisted suicide is for is to help realize self-determination and even advance compassion for people who are suffering. Again, social science evidence shows in Colorado and Oregon and those states that have adopted it, 
that there's that the reality of people with suicidal ideation is that they're 95% of them are suffering from mental illness, mm -hmm. treatable mental illness, including depression. Depression is, is rife among the, the elderly population who's suffering from cancer. And yet these laws don't even ask the question, don't even require an analysis of a person's state of mind to, to make sure that they're not suffering from refractory depression or depression that can even be treated by medicine. Uh, they don't require anyone to be present when they self-administer these lethal drugs. They don't ask what the person's state of mind is when they self-administer the drugs or if anybody's there. So that opens up a whole world of possibilities for abuse, duress. Uh, I mean, most people who choose assisted suicide don't choose it because they're in pain. Mm -hmm. They choose it because they are worried about losing their freedom. They're, they're worried about being a burden to other people. And that is not a person who's flourishing at the height of their powers without any extrinsic pressures bringing, you know, being brought to bear on them. And we that, have that, that last point there that the, the reason uh, that people actually go on and choose uh, assisted suicide is not about physical pain. It's about these other things. I mean, that, that's a pretty consistent statistical reality across, uh, you know, Oregon, Colorado, uh, certainly outside of the U S um, and that, that, that's, that, that's a very, very important point because that is, the ground on which this is sold. It's always sold on why do you want someone to suffer? And, and dug into that, I'm gonna go back to something you said a few minutes ago, dug into that is this vision that, 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 that if value is tied directly to our ability to exert our will, then that value goes, there, there's not an intrinsic value. There's not something, and, and there's, there's, not, there's an assumption that this person can no longer bring good to anyone. I, I went through this personally with my uh, grandfather. He and my grandmother were married for 73 years wow. and she cared for him uh, for the last year. And um, he, um, I, I remember people would say, and people say silly things at funerals. And they said to my grandmother, you had so many good years together. And she is a, she's a pretty ornery woman. She just barked back. I don't care. I wanted more. Oh, even, God even if it's like that, you know? Um, and, 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 this uh, th this idea that people have nothing left to offer, people aren't valuable in and of themselves. And I, I don't want to confuse the point that people are valuable because they have something to offer tangible, like money. Or I mean, now That's not what I mean. I hope you know what I mean. But I, do know, I think it's perfectly clear that what you're saying, that human beings are intrinsically valuable because they're human beings. And the way we would put it, you and I being Christians, they're because they're made in the image and likeness of right. God. That's why they're valuable no matter how diminished they are by disability or age or, or whatever. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, please. Go ahead. No, I, you didn't. That, that you, you said what I was trying to say way better than I tried to say it. So I, it, it's just a really important thing. And, 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 you, and you write in, in, in the book, puts most sim and I'm just quoting you here, put most simply and directly, by virtue of their embodiment, human beings are made for love and friendship. And that idea of being made for love and friendship, we somehow think that they're no longer able to love. They're no longer able to be a friend uh, when they are in some kind of uh, incapacitated state, and that's that's really to misunderstand not only who they are but the sort of creatures we are. I think I completely agree with you, and and that sort of leads into the, what I try to suggest as an anthropological corrective. Right? Okay. I, I I don't just criticize the the current landscape. I try drawing upon McIntyre and others. I try to say, look, what's the tr what's the what would the world look like? What kind of, what kind of anthropology is appropriate to an embodied being, right? And this uh, relates to what you were talking about directly, namely, what, and this also relates to the question about skepticism, about, well, can we, can we really, can we really actually infuse our laws and policies with an anthropology mm -hmm. of embodiment, right? One, and so what, what does an anthropology of embodiment mean, first of all? What it means is you begin with the insight that because we're embodied, because we're mutually dependent, we're vulnerable, we're subject to natural limits, that's what it means to have a corruptible body, right? You come into the world as an infant that's 100% dependent before that, as an unborn child, that's 100% dependent upon another person to take care of you, right? And God willing, throughout our lives, we gradually come to maturity and in, in, in the capacity for independent functioning. And then, but at the end of our lives, we're gonna, it's, we're gonna be vulnerable again, and we're gonna depend upon the beneficence of others for our very survival. And so what Alistair McIntyre says is that as embodied beings, our, not, not just our flourishing, but our very survival itself depends on what he calls networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. 
And that is a world in which there are people who make your good their good without any hope for getting anything back for themselves. It's not a transaction. It's not a contract. It's not what can you do for me? You don't take care of your infant or your grandfather who's, who's passing away because of what you can get in return from them. That's not why we do it. We, and so we come into the world depending on this, these networks. And then if, if, if things go successfully, we, we learn how to become the kind of person that makes the good of another person our own good. So that guarantees the sustainability of these networks, but it also teaches us to be what we're supposed to be as embodied beings, which is people who, who are genuine friends, who are friends to others, who care about others, who, who uh, love their neighbor as they, are, as they love themselves, right? That's, that's the whole point of this. And even if you can never do that, you can participate in networks because of cognitive right. incapacity, or, or even if you don't have a will to power, as a human being, you can participate in these networks as the object of unconditional love and support. So, so you're, there are no subpersonal human beings in the anthropology of embodiment. Whereas in expressive individualism, there are plenty of pre-personal human beings, that is human beings that aren't persons yet, and post-personal human beings, human beings that were persons but aren't anymore, or people right. who will never be persons because they can't exercise their will to power. That, wow, yeah. The thing I keep thinking, and I know this book was specifically written and directed at public policy uh, and changing our laws around this sort of framework. And uh, I, I just keep thinking that this sort of language is so, it's, it's, it's also absent. This sort of framework is also absent in how the church so often talks about what it means to get married, what it means to have children. And, and, and by the church, I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, so many evangelical uh, churches and mainline churches and so on. I know that in, in many ways, the, the, the Catholic church has been consistent because of the influence of John, Ball, John Paul, at least on the philosophical framework. Of course, carrying it out is always uh, the challenge, isn't it? But um, you know, I, I just think of the conversations that, that pastors are having with uh, couples thinking about getting married. And the conversation is, do you guys agree on whether you want to have kids? There's not a conversation about what is the inherent fundamental connection between marrying and procreation? What does it mean that you guys are going to be one, not just emotionally, but one flesh? What does it mean that your marriage is going to be embodied in front of the world and in front of your children? This sort of theological reflection, which I'm not sure that a young couple can make the right decisions in, in this culture, when there's such a uh, powerful, influential, torrential counter framework operating on their hearts and minds and, and their pocketbook shaping their decisions, if they don't have this sort of theological grounding, it, it just seems that it, it's going to be hard to change the public policy part of this, you know, unless we change the church. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think a lot, of, I, I agree with what you're saying. So, you see this actually in the public policy debates. So the public policy debate over abortion in some ways is easier to explain to somebody who's got a, the bad anthropological grounding. You say, you say, don't kill babies. How about that? Like right. we all agree, you don't kill innocent people unjustly. Um, and that's what abortion is, right? That's, that's the unjust killing of an innocent human being. And a lot, even you don't have to think too deeply about your anthropology to get to that conclusion. Okay, we shouldn't kill innocent people. There's enough residual you know, Judeo-Christian, you mm -hmm. know, in the, uh, you know, principles in the atmosphere, you know, to, to keep you to understand that thou shalt not kill, right? Like, but that's, 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 but I noticed in the debate over marriage, right? And this was, and, and, you know, my dear friend, an actual, actually, he's my cousin, Robbie George, mm -hmm. um, you know, was so brilliant in the, in the pro-life debates. And then, but he was, he was, and this isn't his fault, but he was less successful in the marriage debates and persuading people about the conjugal, the conjugal union uh, that, that represents what marriage is, because I think he was, what he was pushing up against was this anthropological problem. People think of, they think of marriage, they think of everything as an instrument to their own self expression, the expression of their deep and true selves. And if you read Anthony Kennedy's opinion in, in the Obergefell decision, that's what he thinks marriage is. Right. He thinks that's marriage exactly is, right. And if you think what marriage is, is a romantic, is a deep romantic friendship between two or maybe more people that's aimed at making them happy, then of course, making, extending marriage to gay folks and other folks, 
to not do that is, is, is unjust, right? If, if that's what you think marriage is, then it doesn't make any sense to, to, to limit it to heterosexual uh, opposite sex couples. It just, it just seems, it seems, it seems mean to do that, right? It doesn't, it, why should, why should that be limited to a certain segment of the population? Right. No, it's a, that, so it that's requires a, a complete reimagining of what we are and what and what marriage is and what what and 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 uh, and and as you say, I mean, and, and if you go through the pre-cana, what we call the pre-cana process in the Catholic Church, the counseling you get from your priest uh, or or you know or religious, um, you know, when you're when you're contemplating marriage, you know, the question is, do you believe that you're that you're married that you have to be? I mean, a, a non-negotiable proposition is that everybody agree that they're that they be open to the gift of children because that's what that's what the Catholic Church believes marriage is. That's the that's the purpose of marriage is to create a civilization of love that can support the growth and development of children, right? And so, um, you know, but 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 that's that's just a conclusion. Like you, if, unless you explain, and this is a problem for us Catholics in the same way that it is for our evangelical brothers and sisters is that we need a, a, a re-education about what, who and what we are and what constitutes our flourishing. And that's, again, oh. what I'm trying to do in this book on the context of bioethics. Well, I, I, I agree that if uh, there's a little bit of thou shalt not kill, that's still something we can rely on on the abortion issue. The expressive individualism has so uh, won on sexuality, on marriage, and then um, on, on what it means to be human. Uh, we, the, the work, the, what we have to push back against culturally is so much greater. And this, this, th this book is, is really brilliant. It's, it, it's a, uh, uh, it is a, uh, a thick read. It is an important read. It is something that I hope that anyone who's going to be involved in premarital counseling or, uh, and by the way, look, every, uh, lawmaker that's trying to make sense of how we're going to handle a population that's getting older and older and older has more and more choices in terms of how they're cared for, how long they live, uh, and so on. And our abilities uh, to give people control over this. I, um, th this is, I, I, in my mind, um, with, with, with so many important conversations happening right now, uh, around the issue of what it means to be human and the importance of the body, uh, this is the, the the first real application uh, at this level that I've seen to issues of bioethics. Why our bodies actually matter. Uh, the author, Professor Carter Schneed from Notre Dame, he's both a professor of law and a professor of political science, and runs the Center for Ethics and Culture there. Uh, the book is called What It Means to Be Human. The case for the body in public bioethics. I feel like we could keep going, but we've uh, we've pushed our time here, for Professor Sneed. Uh, thanks for the book, and thanks for the uh, remarkable amount of clarity today on the Breakpoint Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. Mark.